Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. We can hear and see you. You can see. Okay. We can. Now, I want to see my... There we go. I should warn you that I'm incompetent about these <laughs> Zoom things, so I hope it won't... There's a thing We're grateful. The... We can oh, handle yeah. some difficulties. <laughs> can you... There's a thing in the way of my picture. I don't know whether that's in the way of your picture at the top. That is. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I want to take you back to 1964. Well, it was 1964 when I wrote the paper. This is a paper published in 1965 in Physry of Letters, which apparently eventually got me a Nobel Prize, or that was a long time ago. Um, anyway, this picture describes, it's a space-time picture. Time pretty well always in my pictures goes up. And so you have to think of spaces horizontally. And this is a collapse. You see the matter coming in from the bottom, and it's basically an Oppenheimer-Snyder collapse. They had a, uh, in 1939, they had this um, paper which described a dust cloud which collapsed and formed a singular state in the middle. And a lot of people were very skeptical about this because if you perturb it a little bit or you replace, replace dust, which means pressureless material, by something which has a pressure, then you might think it's different. Mainly, if you disturb the spherical symmetry, then why should it focus itself right in the middle to form this infinite density central point? So there was a lot of argument about these things at the time. When I say at the time, this was round about when quasars were being observed, the early um, 1960s, and uh, people started to worry about this kind of collapse, and could you get something which um, produced this strange objects that people seem to be seeing? with very large, um, well, large uh, energy production, um, maybe a hundred or thousand times in the entire galaxy, but seemed to be very small, something like at least no bigger than the size of the, galaxy, the solar system. So people were speculating whether that might be some kind of a, what we now call a black hole. Well, you see in this picture, I'm trying to characterize the collapse in a way which does not depend on its symmetry. And the key thing is this little ring in the middle, which I'm calling a trap surface. Now, I've thrown away a dimension, so it looks like a ring, but it's really a two-dimensional thing. So I think I better move on to the next picture. No, I have to do it this way, probably. This, you see, have a little surface element at the bottom. So we have a spatial picture down here, but then it's sort of a space-time picture at the top. So I'm imagining a flash of light on that little element. And so we have light rays coming out in the two opposite directions from that little surface. So that's just what this picture is doing. It's showing you how the, these opposite di direct rays from the two sides of the surface. Okay, now here I'm imagining the surface has a bit of curvature to it. And at the top left, you see a surface with concave on one side, convex on the other. And if you have a flash of light on that surface, it will converge on one side and diverge on the other side. Now I want to have something which diverges on both sides. You might think that's a bit strange, but you can certainly do it locally because here at the bottom, I have a picture of two light cones, P and Q are the vertices and the past light cones and their intersection will be a two dimensional surface. You've got to add a dimension, of course, to the cones to make sense of it. Two dimensional surface of intersection and the light rays flashing on either side will be focused towards those two points. So locally, there's nothing peculiar about it. But what is peculiar about it is that I have this surface, what I call a trap surface, which is closed up, is compact, as we call it. And this is a, well, that's what I call a trap surface. And the claim is, you can see that you have these things in the spherical collapse, uh, but you could also, if you perturb it a bit, you will still have them. So that it's not dependent on the spherical symmetry. The existence of a trap surface is a generic phenomenon. Now, what's wrong with it? The trouble is that you can show, I won't go into the details of the theorem, but you look at the future of that, that is to say all the events which come from the future of that initial surface and they form the shaded region here. And what you can show is that the boundary of that shaded region, as long as the local energy density never becomes negative. So this would focus things back out again. If it doesn't become negative, then you will have a compact region here with a closed up surface. I won't go into the details of why that's true and why it's in a contradiction with having an, 
an initial surface, which is this initial uh, initial data surface or Cauchy surface from which the uh, evolution proceeds. And this is a non-compact surface. And you can show from general arguments that this is a contradiction unless your space-time sort of stops. And when it stops, that's what's called a singularity. It's, the reason it probably stops is that the curvature starts to diverge to infinity. This thing doesn't tell you anything about that, but it just tells you that you have something which presumably divergent curvature, just like in the, the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Schneider model, which you've got a divergent curvature. And this case is presumably what happens in general. But anyway, you get a singularity. And the argument is, strictly speaking, it doesn't prove you have a black hole. It's curious that it's, uh, at the time, I certainly didn't know it was produced a black hole. It's the most likely thing. Either you get a black hole or you get something worse. Something worse would be a singularity which you can actually see, which I call the naked singularity. And as long as you don't get naked singularities, it's still not a, it's not a general theorem that you go, don't get them, but it's pretty clear that you don't get them. And what you get is that they're hidden always. You don't see the singularity. It's hidden by the horizon. Okay, well, let's move on to the next picture. Now, you see, these arguments that I used, which were a little bit unusual because people have either looked at exact solutions, if you were more mathematical general relativists, or if they were people who wanted to do calculations, they put things on computers. And either way, you couldn't get much of a, a clue as to what will happen when things, the curvature starts to diverge. And certainly the computer calculations were nowhere near what they are now. And so you had no real handle on what happened. So I was using techniques which were not usual at the time. I gave a talk on my theorem uh, in Cambridge and Stephen Hawking, he was not present at my London talk, which I first gave in 1965, in 64. But in 65, Stephen Hawking was there at the talk and then I had discussions with him and he developed the arguments and developed the techniques so that they would apply to cosmology. So you get a similar result. Here I have a, a cartoon of the evolution of the universe as we now believe it with the exponential expansion that we seem to see in the future. What's going on at the back is just that I don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether it closes up or not. It doesn't matter from anything which I say. It may be open or may be closed. It doesn't matter for the arguments which I want to talk about. However, you seem to get the singularity in the past. Now, let's think of a collapsing situation now. Suppose you have a universe which is collapsing, then it will form black holes in general. This is almost always, if it's perturbed, if it's irregular in some way, you will have black holes conforming as it gets more and more condensed, you more and more certainly get black holes. They will merge with each, with each other. You will have one horrendous singularity at the end with the vial curvature, that is the conformal curvature, diverging wildly. When I say the conformal curvature, it's the curvature which describes free gravity. So, so it's not the part of the curvature which is directly caused by the matter, that's the Ricci curvature, but the vial curvature, what's left, 10 components each, and the vial curvature diverges when you have these singularities in an enormously horrible way. So that's a general collapse. But what do we see? In the beginning, we don't see this. This would be a much more likely kind of Big Bang singularity. What we see is something like that, a nice regular one. Of course, I haven't put in inflation. What people seem to argue that inflation produces you something which smooths out the universe. No way. Because if you had a generic collapse like the one I had here, you put the inflaton field and it makes virtually no difference to the scheme. It, it only just fiddles around when you have almost uh, symmetrical situation. In general, it wouldn't make any difference to the picture. So why isn't the universe like this? Well, I puzzled about this for a long time. It seemed to me a very strange situation that you get something very different in the future from what you get in the past. And people used to think, what's well, the normal assumption, and I thought too, that when you get curvatures which get, start to diverge and produce uh, singularities, um, What's the answer? Well, what you get radii of curvature which get, which get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeter radii. And so that's when you start to say quantum mechanics, quantum gravity must come in. And so the answer to the singularities is quantum gravity. Well, like everybody else, that's what I believed. Now, if it's quantum gravity, which determines the singularities, why is the past not like this? 
and much more like this. And as I say, inflation doesn't answer the question. Um, but I have to remember what my next picture is. It's all tied up with another question, which is the question of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, let me talk about this in a rather crude general way. Here at the top three pictures, I have a gas in a box. So let's imagine this box, and I have a smaller box, which contains a gas, which is all squashed up into that box. I open the, door, the box and the gas spreads out through the box. So you have going left to right, uniformity, increase in uniformity as you go, increasing time as you go from left to right, and increasing entropy as you go from left to right. So this is a general thing you expect with gas and that sort of thing. But what about a huge box now, which is, contains a lot of stars? Now, as we go from left to right, what you tend to find is they clump, and they clump and clump and clump, and we produce what we've just been hearing about, black holes. And so the entropy goes shooting up. The entropy of a black hole is absolutely enormous. If you use the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole, it completely dominates everything else. In fact, in the observable universe, the, the entropy is almost entirely in black holes, utterly in dominates, dominates everything else. So from the point of view of thermodynamics, this is the end point, if you like, that's where we're going. The entropy is increasing left to right, time is increasing left to right, but now the uniform is de decreasing. So what do we see in our actual universe? Well, it's even stronger. You see, I'm pointing out here that there's a strong difference between matter, and when I say matter, I mean radiation as well as material objects, as opposed to gravity. Gravity in the early universe, what we see is uniformity in the early universe, left on the bottom picture, right on the top picture. So as far as everything else is concerned, it's uniformity is, is large entropy. As far as gravity is concerned, it's low entropy. Now, it's even stronger than that, because if you look in the microwave background, you see this beautiful Planck curve. I should say this is the uh, showing the, the, the intensity of the radiation, increasing frequency here. And here I should explain that these are error bars, but the error bars are exaggerated by a factor of 500, so that they really, the errors simply hug the thickness of the incline, or thinner than the incline. I don't know about the last one, but it's certainly thinner than the incline. So this is a real indication. Planck curve, that means maximum entropy. I often puzzled about this. You go back and back and back in time with the entropy presumably going down and down until you get a maximum. That's ridiculous. It's a, how could it be a maximum when it's at the smallest point? Well, people worried maybe the universe is expanding or something. No, no, that's not the answer. When you look at it carefully, it's not that. It is simply that it's in the matter or a matter and radiation that you get high entropy. It's in the gravity that you get low entropy. So we have this very strange situation about the Big Bang, very unlike what you get in singularities in the future. And to me, I used to think, well, it's quantum gravity like everybody else has, that it's a pretty peculiar kind of quantum mechanics or something. What I believe now is it's not. And we shouldn't look at it from the point of view of thinking it's quantum gravity, because quantum gravity doesn't give you, as far as I can see, and nobody has a real consistent theory of it, but it doesn't give you something which is so grossly asymmetric in time as to give you a big bang, which is so completely different from anything you would expect in a collapse with black holes. So I want to study this from a different point of view. This different point of view is conformal geometry. So here I have a beautiful picture by the Dutch artist M.C. Escher, where it's a two-dimensional geometry. It happens to be hyperbolic geometry. Don't worry too much about that. This, uh, you can see, is conformal most beautifully illustrated by the eyes of these fish creatures because they're exact circles and they remain circles right out to the edge. Conformal means that the squashing when they get bigger is the same all the way around. It's a uniform squashing. Small shapes are preserved, angles are preserved. And the beautiful thing about this is you could see infinity. Infinity is a nice smooth region. Now, what about space-time? In space-time, I'll move my pictures up. We, the best thing to think of is the light cones or the null cones, because the conformal geometry simply is the geometry of light cones. Now, the, 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 the null cones, 
are the structure. Now, here is a picture which describes what happens now that we believe that there is a cosmological constant or dark energy or whatever people like to call it. I don't like dark energy as a term because it's, it's not either dark because you, you see through it, it's not really dark, it's transparent, and it's not energy because it repels rather than attracts. However, it's completely consistent with Einstein's cosmological constant that he put in for the wrong reason and then retracted rapidly, which was a mistake. He said it was his biggest mistake to put it in. It, it was his biggest mistake to take it out, I think, because it seems to be the thing which dominates the remote future of our universe. Now, it's very helpful here because when you have a positive cosmological constant, there's a nice theorem due to Helmut Friedrich, which establishes that when you have a generic uh, universe, which is expanding with a positive cosmological constant, if you have massless matter, then you have a beautifully smooth conformal infinity. So like with the Escher picture, you could squash it down and have a very nice smooth conformal infinity. Okay, and in this picture, I'm doing the opposite trick, which is to stretch out the Big Bang. See, I used to say, well, what, who knows what makes it uh, have vanishing bar curvature or very uniform all over, um, but maybe we just postulate that. Well, well, my student had a better way of saying it. Okay, maybe you say, postulate instead that the universe when stretched out conformally is smooth. You have a nice smooth boundary at both ends and that you could, imagine as a smooth manifold, continue it to something beyond. You don't believe that there's anything beyond any more than you believe that anything into the future beyond it. But nevertheless, this is a way of characterizing the Big Bang. That's all very nice and not very outrageous. I want to do something which is outrageous now. That is to suggest that our eon, as I'm now calling, that is Big Bang to remote future, is one of a continual succession, succession of such eons. Our stretch out Big Bang was the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. Our remote future will be the Big Bang of the next future. You might say, well, this makes nice geometrical sense. In fact, it fits pretty well. It also makes physical sense in the sense that Okay, in the remote future, you have very rarefied and very cold material, but when you squash it down, the, the uh, densities and uh, the momentum and, and the positions go the opposite way because of their conjugate variables, and then that means that the low temperature goes to higher temperature. What about the Big Bang? You stretch it out, the very high temperature that gets smaller, so it seems to match quite well physically as well. In order to make it real physics, you'd have to have there being no massive particles. I should say Maxwell's equations are completely conformally invariant, so that's fine. If it's just photons, they could, they're perfectly fine at the end. But you would have other matter, hydrogen, maybe other particles running around. So I have to postulate that the mass gradually fades out. I won't go into the details of expecting that. There are some physical reasons for believing that's a possibility, not a good theory for at the moment. So at the moment, it's just a speculation, but I, I will postulate that now, that the mat matter in the very remote future begins to fade away in its mass. That is, its mass fades away. The, ma the matter doesn't fade away. It just becomes asymptotically massless. What about in the Big Bang? Well, that's much easier because in the Big Bang, the temperatures get so high that the energy of particles is almost entirely in their motions. And so they behave basically as massless. So the closer you get, the closer you get to the Big Bang, the more like massless particles they are. And so the better the approximation is that you consider them to be massless. And therefore it makes physical sense in that sense to match them. Now, I used to go lecturing about this for a long time in the early days of this, uh, uh, this century. And I forget, I mean about, 20, no, not as much as 15 years ago or so. And I, I thought that, well, nobody's ever going to prove me wrong, so I can go on lecture about this forever. But then I began to think, well, maybe there is a way you could prove that this is either right or wrong. And that is to look at, I hope I can get the right picture. Well, this is first, you can see signals can get through in principle. This is the previous eon there, that's the succeeding eon, and light rays could get through. So in principle, the light could get through. They could get through if the frequency is low enough. So that's certainly a possibility. 
Um, I can't seem to, oh, there's the picture I want. Here we have a cartoon of this middle plane thing is really a three-dimensional crossover surface. That's the join between the previous eon and our eon. I'm imagining that there's a cluster of galaxies down here. And in a cluster of galaxies, there will be more or less be one point in this crossover surface if it survives, but they would be swallowed black holes which run into each other. And each time they run into each other, there will be an, an explosion with gravitational waves coming out and then bang, 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 they do it several times and you will get a signal of these gravitational waves coming through that you might see. And they would be concentric if they come from one galactic center. At the bottom, I have rather faintly drawn, I don't suppose you can even see it, I can't see it, but this is meant to be hard to see, concentric circles. So what you see is concentric circles. And my Armenian colleague, Vahe Gurzajan, did an analysis on this looking for concentric rings, at least three of them, to get a significant signal, which were of low variance. So that was his criterion. And that they should be, in the, in the theoretical consideration, they should be of low variance than the normal ring, uh, variance around a ring. And that's the way he did the analysis. And this is a picture of the Planck data, the Planck satellite data, looking at rings of low variance concentric triples, and these are the centers of these rings. And what I found very remarkable, not expected at all, but not impossible, very remarkable, is how clumped they are. I should say that this, these middle two strips are to be ignored because they're, remo they're not in the consideration. That's where the galaxy is, so you don't look at that strip at all. So the reason that you don't see any of these points there is just because you don't, they, they're not in the consideration, in the in the analysis. However, you do have this big red region here. Red leap means warm, which means blue shifted. And in this signal, blue shifted means distant. It's all the wrong way around, but it's the right way around in the sense that red is distant. So here you are looking at, according to the theory, a very distant super duper cluster of galaxies. That's the centers. And here we have in a little bit nearer, pretty far off, but within our particle horizon. This would be with outside our particle horizon. We can see outside because the our light cone goes into the previous eon and it explores what would be outside our current particle horizon. That's all right. This is a sort of intermediate region. So apparently we get these huge super duper clumps, apparently not seen because they're much too large in the signals that we see at the moment. If that's not the explanation, I'd like to see another explanation for this signal. I find it very remarkable that they, they're, they're selected for no reason having to do with the intensity, just the variance of the temperature. So the fact that you see them red here and blue there is a clumping in their overall temperatures, which is not what they're selected for. So in the theory, they're clumping because they're clumped in distance as well as in, in arc, um, in three dimensions, let's say. They're clumped in three dimensions. Okay. Here's the other thing which we looked at. This is a Polish group headed by Christoph Meisner. This was for signals. Here we have a supermassive black hole. They hang around for an awful long time. The biggest ones will hang, along for, hang around for something like 10 to the 100 years, according to Don Page. And you have, might have to wait 10 to, 10 to the 103 years or so for the even biggest ones. So from something like 10 to the 60 years to 10 to the 100 years, and these black holes will finally disappear. What happens to them and their radiation? Well, according to the theory, this is a paper published about nine months ago or so, or perhaps less than that now, by Christoph Meisner, Daniel Ann, Pavel Nirovsky, and me in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And this is the crossover surface from the previous eon to ours. The previous eon is down here, according to the theory. This is us up here. Well, this is just a, a, a plot of the, well, here we have a supermassive black hole. All the Hawking radiation, everything, because it's so late, will be concentrated in a tiny, tiny little spot on the crossover surface. So it be, doesn't matter what happens to it, how much of the black hole goes in the radiation, how, how much what, it's all squashed into a little tiny point on the other side, it would be less than the Planck scale point. So you have now that radiation, you can do integrals around it to see that the mass has to be conserved and you know how much mass is coming through. And this mass coming through 
I should say smooth across here, smooth across here. This is a singularity in the, in the crossover. But it spreads out, you don't see anything. The photons will scatter. And by the sort of work that Jim Peebles got his Nobel Prize for last year, and you see the 380,000 years, only the, the photons escape round about here. This is decoupling or, or last scattering or around about the same place. And this region is about four degrees across the sky. It, we're about, that's about eight times the moon's diameter. And what you seem to see is points which would be heated to about, I think the strongest ones, about 30 times the normal variations in temperatures. I don't know why people haven't seen them before, except just that they haven't looked because people believe that inflation would iron out all these things. But to the final comment here is that the analysis by Christoph's method is that the, they exist in the sky to a confidence level of 99.98%. They are, the, there's a different analysis to find the actual points. I'm not sure how confident we are in the exact actual points, but the five strongest ones in the Planck data are seen also in exactly the same places in the WMAP data. So I think they're pretty good confident that they, those are actual Hawking points. The, I'm calling the Hawking points that the Hawking evaporation is here and spreads out to this eight, eight times the diameter of the moon spot. And the, there's another one in the W map, just about as strong as the other five. And that sixth one is also seen exactly the same place in the Planck data. So those six points, I would say people should have a good look at them because I think they are the indications of what's happened in the previous eon. And I'll leave that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely talk and very interesting ideas that you're pushing for all of us to think about in the future. There are um, many questions that have popped on the screen. Um, I'm going to take a few of them if you have time. Sure. Um, so the most popular question is, do the putative conformal maps between successive big bangs conserve entropy? Yes, if you look at them the right way. I mean, they're just conformal maps, you see. So you have to say what you mean by the entropy. I mean, do they conform, do they preserve energy? Well, you see, they don't preserve energy in a sense because it gets squashed and things get hotter or they get stretched and it gets colder. But, but you, when you do the right kind of integral, I said you could do an integral and tell how much mass is inside, you can correct for that. But the entropy, there's no integral that I can say which tells you how much entropy is. All I would say is that the conformal map is only a map. It doesn't tell you by looking at it what the entropy in a black hole is. So we know what the entropy in a black hole is just by taking the Bekenstein Hawking formula. And that formula tells you huge, it's a huge entropy. And the entropy in the universe is pretty well all concentrated in these little points. And so what happens to the second law of thermodynamics? That's a, certainly a good question. Well, it's the dynamics. You have what happens to the degrees of freedom? That's what you want to know, because it's the degree, the randomized re degrees of freedom, which give you the entropy. And those degrees of freedom are simply destroyed. I mean, they're, they're in the Planck scale dynamics of the next eon. And there is no theory of what happens to Planck scale dynamics. Do we preserve degrees of freedom? I don't see why. So this is all I can say. Of course, you have to, you have to get the entropy down so that it's low, close to zero in the next eon. That's absolutely right. But that's, uh, that's the argument. It's not the argument I used to use. It's the argument I'm using now because the Hawking points seem to me to where they go. Thank you. Michael Turner would like to ask if you have a, a comment on the following. He absolutely agrees that inflation does not answer your question about the apparent regularity of the beginning, but it does sidestep it by creating a large piece of space time that looks like it had a regular beginning from a tiny regular piece. No, this is, uh, I'm saying this argument does that. Because mm -hmm. this argument, see, you see, the Big Bang is that surface here. And it's a smooth surface because it's a conformal continuation 
of almost vacuum on the other side. Well, it's, it's only radiation, basically, or, or massless quantities. So that it's it's uh, that gives you, and then and then you you get the uh, radiation. Sure, the radiation comes through, as I said in the previous uh, one of these mm -hmm. previous pictures. So the radiation comes through, and so you get uh, certainly a temperature on the other side, but it's very very uniform because uh, you're just looking at the space between the black holes. And that very uniform space is the uniformity. So, so it doesn't sidestep it, it gives it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lovely. We'll see if Michael wants to comment again. So um, Paul Hepburn asks, do you recall Dennis Shiama's and Fred Hoyle's reactions to the singularity theorems given their support of the steady state theory? Yes, indeed. Yes, that was very interesting. Well, you see, I used to be, I mean, Dennis was my main source of physics. I, I, I went to Cambridge as a graduate student in pure mathematics. But then Dennis uh, took me under his wing and decided he was, I was somebody who should involve me in, 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 in cosmology and so on. And when he wanted me to change to cosmology. I didn't do that, but I learned a lot from him. And at that time, yes, the steady state model was, 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 the, was the great thing in Cambridge. And I knew Bondi, and I knew Gold, and I knew Hoyle, and I knew Dennis Sharma. And when the uh, Penzias and Wilson observations came apart, and came about, and it be, and became clearer and clearer that the steady state model had to be wrong, Dennis struggled a bit, and he thought he produced some explanation for a bit. And then when he convinced that he was wrong, and I had enormous respect for Dennis, he went around giving lectures saying, I was wrong. The steady state model is wrong. The Big Bang was there. We have to change our minds. Now, I thought that was amazing. Fred Hoyle didn't. He, he, he sort of vacillated for a long time and stuck the steady state and various versions of it. Uh, but, but Dennis was absolutely direct and honest as, you, as a scientist should be. And I had tremendous respect for that. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> uh, does the black hole evaporation time set the time scale between successive phases of a cyclic cosmology? Well, the time scale, you have to worry about this because the time scale is really infinite in the sense of, well, it depends how you flow. Time. So if the mass fades out, then you don't have a notion of time scale defined intrinsically because the fade out is probably different for different particles and you don't have a consistent time. There is a time which is defined by the cosmological constant. And that's not a measurable time really. It would come out as infinite for that. But for materials thing, when you see it, what's much, what's much better is to talk about conformal time. Because when you draw the conformal diagrams, you see you have a the, the horizontal plane, if you like, which is the Big Bang, and then the horizontal plane, which is infinity. And there is a conformal time between the two, which is defined conformally. And you could say, what, what is the time now? The time now is about three quarters of the way thrown. It's about, um, well, if you think of a clock going around, it's about uh, um, quarter, to, quarter to midnight. <laughs> so we, we're three, about three quarters of the way through. So the thing is, that's a good measure of when interesting things happen. You see how if you take the conformal time as, as how long interesting things happen, it's not a bad measure. And they get very boring in the remote future. So to say, say that's just time ticking away when you're waiting for the, the few odd black holes to disappear with a, with a hawking evaporation pop, it's not, uh, <laughs> not terribly exciting. In fact, that was the origin of my considering this model, was I was just thinking how incredibly boring the universe is going to be. Boring, 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 and just more boring. But then I thought, what about the photons? They're not going to be bored. It's very hard to bore a photon because <laughs> they don't experience any time at all. They just whip out and there they are at infinity. And maybe they just probe and see what do they see on the other side. So that was, that was really the origin of this picture. All right. So I think I'll try to pick the final couple of questions so we don't take up too much of your time. Um, are these uh, gravitational waves potentially observable? Oh, yes. Oh, the, the ones I was talking about, the big ones. Yeah. Oh, you mean coming through? Yes. What do you say? I claim we see them. I mean, this is, this is um, in the analysis that, well, the Poles also did it. So Christoph and his group also looked 
analyzing it in a different way. So they looked, I'm talking about gravitational waves from the previous eon, is that the question? Yes, I think it is. Yes, no, no, you should see them. And mm -hmm. these would be seen from the collisions between supermassive black holes. And the analysis that the Polish people did, this was Christoph Meisner, um, uh, Pavel Nurowski, and a Polish fellow whose name I've unfortunately forgotten. Um, but um, they also had a, a confidence level of the signal. And they said, they didn't look for triples. They looked for just for the temperature being bigger or smaller over the, over mm -hmm. the rings, for single rings, not triples of, of rings. And their confidence level was um, 99 point, no, 94 point, 99.4, I'm saying it wrong. 90, I think it's only 94%. So it wasn't a strong signal. But I thought, you know, that's seeing a signal by a completely different way from, but Vahe didn't do an analysis in that way. He did a different way of analyzing to see whether they would be oh. a Namely, where they, what, if, if you look for elliptical shapes, do you see them? And the numbers drop dramatically when you look for ellipses. Mm -hmm. So, so something which gives you circular shapes and, and that when you look for ellipses, they don't have to be very elliptical before they drop away completely. And uh, so what is it that causes these, these signals which produce rings? Oh, and another thing about it is that the rings have a limit of, there you, they shouldn't, you shouldn't see that you, sh if the previous eon was like ours in the sense that the, say the constants of nature weren't particularly different, then the creation of supermassive black holes should be about what you expect in our eon. And this would give you a kind of limit to how big the rings should be. And that limit is about 40 degrees across the sky. Vahe sees them up to about 30, a little more than 30 degrees. So I think that's pretty good. That's cool. All right, we have one last question. I think this one is nice for the, also for the students in the audience. Um, yes. What was the most exciting Eureka moment of your career when you really <laughs> saw something new and understood it? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> That's a difficult one. I mean, this is one of them, I would say, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you say, could, if the theory is right, then it was a good Eureka moment. <laughs> <laughs> this was certainly one of them. So, so since I, I, I mean, the others were in different subjects. Well, I think the black hole, yeah, the idea of a trapped surface, that was certainly an idea. Like, there were one or two others. But, but let me say, I would think the, the uh, thinking the new Eon one was probably the biggest. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. And I think on behalf of everyone listening, not only thank you, thank all three speakers, but this has just been a special pleasure for all of us. Um, we appreciate you coming in from, from England and the others from Germany and California. I mean, what, what a crazy but special moment to be able to hear all of you despite um, still being trapped in our homes. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to all the listeners for attending today. I think it was a wonderful session. I couldn't have asked for more. Um, so thank you all. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their APS experience. So for now, we'll continue on with the rest of the meeting. Thank you all. Thanks again for the speakers. Great fun. It was fun. Thank you. So thanks, everybody. I will, I guess, um, bid you good day. <laughs> it's weird to have this moment where we're just done. <laughs> <laughs>